Hi, I'm John, and in this IT Taster video, I'm going to cover DNS. DNS plays a key role in pretty much every network. Technologies like the Internet and Active Directory rely on DNS to name but a few. So it's really important to have a good understanding of how DNS works. I'm going to go through some DNS theory. We'll take a look at DNS on a Windows 2012 server and finish off with some command line tools we can use to test and troubleshoot DNS. DNS stands for Domain Name System and it performs a very important function. It translates computer names to IP addresses and this happens all the time when we surf the internet and when we access resources on our local network. Now the process of translating user-friendly computer names into IP addresses is known as resolution. Networks rely on properly configured resolution because if you can't resolve computer names to IP addresses, users and network services won't be able to find the resources they need to access. So DNS works like an index in a book. It's a database, a distributed database, that resides on a server configured to service DNS requests, a DNS server, and its job is to resolve computer names, host names, to IP addresses. In this example, a DNS client, in this case a PC, needs to resolve a computer name, a host name, to an IP address. DNS clients run something called a resolver. This is an application normally built into the operating system and its job is to query the DNS server. The resolver sends a query to the DNS server to resolve the computer name, the host name, to an IP address. This is the most common type of DNS request and it's called a forward lookup. A forward lookup resolves a computer name, a host name, to an IP address. It's also possible to perform a reverse lookup. A reverse lookup does the exact opposite of the forward lookup query. It resolves an IP address to a host name. And this can be particularly useful when performing troubleshooting. Now both of these examples of lookup queries are very simplified. But before we take a closer look at how DNS resolution works, we need to talk about the domain namespace. The domain namespace is a naming scheme that is organized into a tree-like hierarchy. If we take a look at the example host1.ittaster.com, this is known as a fully qualified domain name, an FQDN. A fully qualified domain name gives the exact location within the tree structure. Each level in the domain tree structure is separated by a full stop. It's very similar to specifying a path to a file by quoting all of the folder levels. Now the important thing to remember is the domain names are resolved from right to left. If we take a look at host1.ittaster.com again, the first part of the fully qualified domain name we're interested in is the full stop after the .com. The full stop is extremely important. It's the root domain the very top of the tree and the highest level of the domain hierarchy. This isn't something we need to type when we enter a domain name into our web browser, it's taken care of for us, but you can type it if you wish and it's perfectly acceptable. Below that we have what are known as top level domains. These indicate the type of organization like .gov, .org or geographical location such as .co.uk. Now from here on full stops are used to separate each domain level. Next are the second level domains. These are the domains that are registered to individuals or various organizations. For example our domain is called IT Taster. Now any domains below this are subdomains or host devices. Subdomains can be used to divide a name, for example an organization may have a north and south region office. The domain could be divided into north.ittaster.com and south.ittaster.com. And finally we have the host, a device, normally a PC or a server. 
Now the reason it's important to understand how a fully qualified domain name is structured is because this same hierarchy is used by DNS to resolve a fully qualified domain name. Let's take a look at the domain name resolution process. In this example the client PC needs to access a resource on the network server1 by its fully qualified domain name which is server1.ittaster.local The client PC checks its local hosts file. A local hosts file is simply a plain text file that can be used to manually specify host name to IP address mappings. Under normal circumstances you don't need to configure the local hosts file but the important thing to remember is that the local host file is read before DNS. The client machine then checks its own resolver cache and if the resource has been accessed previously the host name and IP address will be stored in the resolver cache. In this example the client PC's hosts file and resolver cache do not contain the information needed to resolve server1.ittaster.local so the client PC sends a forward lookup query to the local DNS server. The local DNS server is able to resolve server1.ittaster.local and it returns the IP address to the client PC. Server1 can now be accessed by its IP address and this is how we would expect DNS resolution to function within the local network. Let's take a look at what happens when we want to access an external resource. For example, our client PC needs to access a website called www.ittaster.com. The client PC checks its hosts file and local resolver cache. The client PC's hosts file and resolver cache are unable to resolve www.ittaster.com. So the client PC sends a forward lookup query to the local DNS server. This type of query is known as a recursive query. A recursive query is sent to a DNS server to fully resolve the domain name on behalf of a client. The local DNS server checks its DNS zone database to answer the query and failing that its cache. If the local DNS server is unable to answer the query it passes the query to a root DNS name server. This type of query is known as an iterative query. An iterative query returns the best possible information the DNS server has. If the DNS server is unable to fully resolve the query it will send back a referral to a DNS server lower down the domain hierarchy. Now if you're wondering how the local DNS server is able to find the root DNS servers it has a built-in pre-configured list of root DNS server IP addresses known as root hints. The root DNS server isn't able to fully resolve www.ittaster.com but it knows about the top level.com domain name servers so it sends back a referral to the .com top level domain name servers. The local DNS server sends a request to the .com top level domain name server to resolve www.ittaster.com. The .com top level domain name server isn't able to fully resolve www.ittaster.com but it knows about the servers that look after ittaster.com. So it sends back a referral to the second level domain name servers that look after ittaster.com. The local DNS server sends a request to the second level domain name servers to resolve www.ittaster.com. The second level domain name server doesn't have authority for www.ittaster.com, but it knows about the ittaster.com name server so it sends back a referral to the IT Taster domain name server. The local DNS server makes a request to the IT Taster name server and because the IT Taster name server has authority for www.ittaster.com it returns the IP address to the local DNS server 
which is also cached. It's worth pointing out that www isn't strictly a host name. The actual web server might be called something like web server 1 for example. But DNS allows us to create aliases for our hosts. And finally, the local name server returns the IP address to the client PC. Enable it to access the web server www.ittaster.com by its IP address. The next important DNS component I'm going to cover is zones. Zones enable us to divide our domain namespace into manageable portions. If we take a look at the ittaster.com domain name in this example, we have north and south subdomains representing two geographical locations. Let us imagine we have 2000 hosts based at the north site and 5000 hosts based at the south site. That's a lot of hosts to administer. DNS enables us to divide our namespace into zones. We can have a zone for the north portion of our domain namespace and another zone for the south portion of our domain namespace. One administrator is able to manage the IT taster and north domains while another administrator is able to manage the south domain. This enables us to distribute the task of DNS administration. A DNS server holds the zone database file. The zone database file stores the zone records, the actual name to IP address mappings. So when a DNS server is queried, it checks its zone database file for the name to IP address mapping. You can have more than one DNS server per zone, and a DNS server can look after more than one zone. In order to provide a high level of availability and resilience, more than one DNS server normally hosts a zone. Should a DNS server fail, other DNS servers hosting the zone are still able to resolve queries. The primary DNS server holds the master copy of the zone database file, known as the primary zone database file. This is where changes to the zone are made, such as adding new name to IP address records. Secondary DNS servers maintain a copy of the primary DNS server information in a secondary zone database file. Primary and secondary domain name servers are also referred to as master and slave DNS servers. The process of updating copies of the zone database file held on a secondary DNS server is known as a zone transfer. The zone database file is copied from the primary DNS server to the secondary DNS server. Zone transfers are required to update and synchronize copies of the primary zone database. It's also important to restrict which secondary DNS servers are able to obtain zone file updates to prevent security problems. Okay, let's go to the server and take a look at a zone file. To open the DNS management console, we need to click on tools and click on DNS. We need to expand our DNS server, server 1, expand forward lookup zones and click on the ittaster.local zone. Now it's important to point out ittaster.local is an internal domain and it's also an active directory integrated domain. This particular server is a local DNS server that provides DNS resolution to client devices within the local network and it's certainly not a server we'd want to expose to the outside world. There are some DNS record entries that really belong in an external DNS server zone file database. However, I've added them to our internal DNS server purely to explain what they are should you come across them. OK, let's take a look at the zone records. The first record I want to talk about is the start of authority or SOA record. The SOA record is the first record in the DNS zone file and it specifies the authoritative server, the master name server for the domain, which in this case is server 1. Now below the SOA record we have a name server or NS record. 
This type of record specifies the domain's name server or servers. We can see that server 1 is the server that will service DNS queries. Now you'll notice we have a number of host A records. These records are what DNS is really all about. They map a host name to an IP address. And we can see that the host name server 1 is mapped to the IP address of 192.168.0.200. Now there are a couple of other record types you're likely to encounter, one of which is the canonical name or CNAME record. A CNAME record simply enables us to create an alias, an alternative name for an existing host. One alias we come across a lot is www when we access a web server. And we can see that www is really an alias for server 2. However, we'd normally encounter a web server mapping on an external DNS server. Now the last record I want to talk about is the mail exchanger or MX record. MX records are used to specify which server mail is to be delivered to. And again, this sort of record would normally belong to an external DNS server. We can also add new zone records. Let's say, for example, we have a new server called Server 3, and we want to create a new host record for it. To create a new host record, we need to right-click the ittaster.local zone, choose New Host, specify the name of our host, which is Server 3, Specify the IP address Now notice the create associated pointer record is ticked. This will create an entry for server 3 in the reverse lookup zone. Click add host Click OK and click done. And we can see our new host record. The host server 3 is mapped to the IP address of 192.168.0.202. Now if we expand our reverse lookup zones and click on our reverse lookup zone, we can see the IP address 192.168.0.202 is mapped to the host server3.ittaster.local. Let's go back to our ittaster.local forward lookup zone and let's create a CNAME record, an alias for server 3. I'm going to create the alias FTP for server 3 to identify it as an FTP server. To create a new CNAME record, you need to right click the ittaster.local zone, choose new alias specify the alias name which is FTP specify the server's fully qualified domain name which is server3.ittaster.local and click OK and there we can see our new alias of FTP which is actually server3.ittaster.local OK, I want to finish off by showing you a couple of useful commands we can use to test and troubleshoot DNS. The first one is NSLOOKUP. NSLOOKUP, or Name Server Lookup, as its name suggests, lets us query a name server to resolve a host. And it works pretty much the same in both Windows and Linux. Now NSLOOKUP has two modes, interactive and non-interactive mode. Non-interactive mode is useful if you need to perform a quick lookup of a single host. And to do this, we need to type nslookup, followed by the fully qualified domain name of a host we wish to resolve. I'm going to choose server3.ittaster.local. And this needs to be followed by the host name or IP address of a DNS server we want to query which in my case is 192.168.0.200 Here we can see my DNS server 192.168.0.200 
which resolves to server1.ittaster.local and there's our host server3.ittaster.local which resolves to the IP address 192.168.0.202 now if we type nslookup server3.ittaster.local again if we omit a DNS server NSLOOKUP will send the query to a default DNS server. Now in this case it's server1.ittaster.local but you do need to be aware of the difference. Now we can also perform a reverse lookup and to do this we need to type NSLOOKUP followed by the IP address we wish to resolve. Let's choose 192.168.0.202 now again if we omit a DNS server our query will be sent to the default DNS server our default DNS server is server1.ittaster.local and our IP address 192.168.0.202 resolves to server3.ittaster.local if we need to perform a number of queries we can use NSLOOKUP interactive mode. To do this type NSLOOKUP and hit return. At the prompt type server followed by the host name or IP address of the name server we want to query. In my case it's server1.ittaster.local NSLOOKUP will display the default server our queries will be sent to which is server1.ittaster.local so all we need to do now is type a host name or IP address to resolve let's try server3.ittaster.local and as we can see server3 is resolved to the IP address 192.168.0.202 now we can also perform reverse lookups by simply typing an IP address. Let's try 192.168.0.201. And this resolves to server2.ittaster.local. Now if we type help, this will display a list of command options that we can use with NSLOOKUP. And finally we can type exit or quit to exit NSLOOKUP. The ipconfig command has some useful switches we can use with DNS. For example we can take a look at our computer's resolver cache by typing ipconfig forward slash display DNS. And if we need to we can also clear the resolver cache by typing ipconfig forward slash flush DNS. Now both of these switches can be particularly useful when troubleshooting resolution issues. Now the final ipconfig switch I'm going to show you is ipconfig forward slash register DNS. ipconfig forward slash register DNS will renew the client's registration with the DNS server. Well I hope this video has been helpful, please subscribe to the IT Taster channel, your comments are welcome and thanks for watching.